Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to building an adjustable LED drive circuit and this is going to be part one in a two-part series. You can support Forstronics on Patreon. You can also find exclusive content from this video on Patreon. If you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up and also if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel. All right, let's get started. Okay, in this video series, we're going to cover how to design a simple LED drive circuit that can power a large amount of analog LEDs and allows you to easily adjust the brightness. Now, what is an LED drive circuit? An LED drive circuit is basically a circuit that allows you to output a, an exact amount of current or an exact current value because essentially an LED is a current controlled device. So I'm sure you're probably familiar with voltage regulators. You have linear and switch mode voltage regulators. Well, an LED drive circuit is essentially a current regulator circuit, right? And the fact that we can adjust the brightness of the LEDs means we can adjust the output current from the LED while the voltage can vary. The centerpiece of our LED drive circuit will be the AL8862 from Diodes Incorporated. And I chose this for my drive circuit because it's easy to implement it's adjustable and it's easy to adjust, which I'll talk more about later, and it's low cost. Just like I mentioned, voltage regulators have different types of architectures. I've mentioned that in past videos, linear architecture and switch mode architecture. LED drive circuits can have linear and switch mode architectures. I'm going with a switch mode architecture because it has better efficiency, and I'll be using a buck-based switch mode architecture, which I'll talk about later. As I mentioned, this is a two-part series. So in part one, we're gonna talk about the target LED applications and the configurations of our circuit. And the reason I have to mention applications is because there's a lot of different types of LED applications as well as a lot of different types of LED drive circuits. We'll talk about the theory of operation for our drive circuit and the circuit implementation we'll look at in my EagleCAD software. For part two, we'll look at a demo of the LED drive circuit and we'll adjust the current and the brightness in the demo We'll look at the PCB layout for our circuit, and then we'll look at some example measurements. We'll look at, we'll make sure we're getting the right amount of current from our drive circuit. We'll measure the efficiency and things like that. Okay, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different LED drive applications. And because of that, there's a lot of different LED drive ICs on the market with various voltage and current combinations, as well as different features and price points. And the reason I wanna mention that is because this LED drive circuit may not be for everybody. If you're trying to design applications where you have high powered LEDs, small counts, this is not going to be the LED drive circuit for you. This LED drive circuit is going to be meant to power large strings of LEDs that are medium to lower power. And I'm designing this for a horticulture application for indoor plant growth, but it's also good for commercial lighting, industrial lighting, where you need large strips of LED. Some home lighting applications use large strips of LED. Entertainment applications use large, use large strips of LEDs. So that's the target of this LED drive circuit. And let me show you an example of an LED configuration that this drive circuit's gonna be good for. Here's a schematic of a combination of LEDs that are in series and in parallel. So I'm showing 50 different LEDs and for this application I'm using warm white LEDs. The LEDs take a maximum current of 200 milliamps and they drop about 2.75 volts, but sometimes that can vary a little bit depending on the LED. Below, I'm showing some of the specs of the LED drive IC we're gonna use, and it can do up to 60 volts, 60 volt input. Its output's gonna be, it can't quite go up to 60 volts, but close to it. And then it has a maximum output of one amp of current. So if you remember, current is common in series, and voltage is common in parallel, but in series voltage is slowly dropped across to different devices in the series path. In this case, it's our LEDs. So if you notice, these LEDs take a maximum of 200 milliamps, as I mentioned before. So if you have five of them in parallel, you can add those currents up to one amp. So our LED IC could handle these parallel combinations of LEDs. And as long as we don't have more in series that goes over 60 volts, our IC can handle this LED drive. So if you look, we have 10 columns of five LEDs. So 10 times 2.75 volts, that's about 27 volts. So at one amp and 27 volts, our LED drive circuit can handle this panel or string of LEDs. In fact, we could actually put two of these together. Two of these together would be one amp and 55 volts. 
So our LED drive circuit can handle that. Now you could also go with higher power LEDs. If you go with LEDs that are just one amp to fully power them, then you would just have one series string of these LEDs and you could put as many as you want in series as long as you don't get above 60 volts. So once again, that's what we're targeting with this LED drive circuit is a large amount of low power to medium powered LEDs in typically a series combination, but you could add them in parallel if they're lower current. All right, here's a typical application diagram of our AL8862IC. Where did I get this circuit block diagram? I got it from the data sheet. And if you watch my videos before, whenever I work with a new IC, I always read the data sheet. And so anything I talk about in this video, you know, how I got different part specifications and how I implemented it is all from studying the data sheet. So for this circuit, we can input up to 60 volts, right? And as low as five volts. And that voltage and that power source travels through here, through our set. And then it's showing the string of LEDs. So it's just showing two LEDs and kind of showing the dot, dot, dot to show it could be more. And so the, the LED panel that I just showed, that's what can go here in this part of the circuit. And, and like I said, we could have up to two panels because that would have been 55 volts. Then we have our inductor L1, we have D1. Of course, this block is the IC itself, and then we have C1 on the input. So let me talk about the way this works. This is a current controlled circuit, and the way it does that is by R set. So the value you use for R set sets what the maximum current will be for this circuit. And once again, the data tells you what, what values to use for R set. So if you use 0.1 ohm, you can get the maximum of one amp current flow through your LEDs. And then they recommend lower values if you don't want to go up to one amp. So what happens is the chip is inputting voltage before our set and then after our set. So we have V in, which is monitoring the input voltage. This is not where power is flowing. Then we have set, which is monitoring the voltage on the output of our set before the LEDs. So what it does is it's trying to regulate a certain voltage drop across our set. So if you regulate a certain voltage drop across our set, you can determine what current is flowing through our set. So that's how it's regulating the current flow, not the voltage, right? The voltage will vary based on how many LEDs you have in this series string. Then we have L1, and L1 is an inductor, and you should know an inductor can store energy in the form of a magnetic field, which allows it to store current. And then we have these pins, SW, which stands for switch and ground. So inside the chip, you essentially have a switch, not a mechanical switch, but a MOSFET switch. And then based on the values of VIN and VSET, a voltage comparator circuit and a clock drive a pulse width modulated signal to turn this switch on and off to vary the current that's flowing through L1 and regulate it so the average current is one amp. So let's talk about how this would work. So when current, or I should say power, is first applied to this circuit, you'll get a voltage across L1 and this switch will close, creating a path for current to flow. But at the very instant that the power is applied, L1 presents a large impedance to current and so you get a large voltage drop across L1. As L1 builds up its magnetic field, current starts to flow and ramp up in a linear fashion. Once the current reaches about one amp, actually it'll go a little higher than one amp, the right voltage drop is sensed across our set, and what happens is we now open this switch. Now current can no longer flow to ground, so L1, the magnetic field across L1, starts to collapse and induce a current flow through D1 and essentially takes the place of the power supply current that flows through our set and through our diodes. Now, once again, the switch is only gonna be open for a split second. Then once the voltage drop across our set gets too low, the signal will close the switch again, and this will happen over and over. And once current's flowing through L1, current never goes back down to zero, but you'll get this, so you get a constant current flow with a triangle or sawtooth wave on top of it, right? And that's why we say this type of circuit is noisier than a linear circuit. A switch mode circuit is noisier than a linear circuit. Now, since this can switch up to one megahertz, 
The way we'll configure it, it'll only switch about 200 kilohertz, as we'll see later. But since this can switch so fast, we don't notice that little bit of a sawtooth waveform of current on the top that'll cause a little bit of flicker. Our eyes can't pick it up. And once again, this type of circuit is going to be pretty efficient, and we'll make an efficiency measurement in part two, but we'll see it's over 90% efficient. C1 in this circuit is just trying to maintain a constant voltage. Because the current is kind of changing rapidly, C1 charges and discharge rapidly to maintain a constant voltage here. This pin, which is not connected, is actually the control to control the brightness. So like I said before, the maximum current flow is set by our set, but we can use this control pin to lower that current. And you can use either an analog DC value or you can use a pulse width modulated signal from a microcontroller. Because pulse width modulated signals are cheaper than DAC signals, and what I mean by that is microcontrollers typically have more pulse width modulation pins than DAC pins, and for my application, I'm gonna have multiple LED drive circuits. I'm gonna use the pulse width modulated signal to control the brightness. And we'll see a demo of that in part two. But the idea here is if you put in a pulse width modulated signal of 100% duty cycle, then you'll get max current as set by R set. Once you lower the duty cycle, there's a linear relationship between the current dropping and the pulse width modulated signal's duty cycle. And for the pulse width modulated signal, they recommend a frequency of about 500 hertz. And once again, we'll, show it, we'll see a demonstration of that using an ESP32 in part two. Here's the block diagram of the IC we were just looking at. So this is the IC, it's sort of turned 90 degrees on its side from the picture we were just looking at. You can see V in and, and the set pin. So these are connected across our set. And look, they have a current monitor, but which is really just a voltage comparator. Based on the output of this block, this drives the pulse width modulated signal and the duty cycle of that signal to control this driver block which drives the gate of the MOSFET, which is acting like our switch, and it's turning on and off rapidly to control the current flowing through the inductor. You can see our control pin right here, and you can see it can either be a pulse width modulated signal or a DC for dimming, but that's essentially adjusting the brightness. Okay, let's look at our own implementation of this circuit in our Eagle CAD software. Okay, this is my Eagle CAD software, which I use for PCB layout, but first you have to do the schematic. So this is our implementation of the, the application circuit we just looked at with the value of components we picked out. You should be able to recognize L1, this is the inductor, we have resistors, we have the diode D1, R1 is the sense resistor, C1 is that input capacitor, and of course this block IC1 is the AL8862. These green lines represent connections or nodes where our current can flow. And where you see a green line with a dot that represents two lines that are connected or two circuit elements that are connected, where there's no dot, that means there's no connection. Where you see LED low and LED high, that's where we, we would connect our series string of LEDs that we wanna power. PWM control is the control signal from a microcontroller that we use to control the brightness. So R1 is the set resistor, and like I said before, we wanna use the max of one amp, so I'm using 0.1 ohms, which is what the data sheet says to use. You also wanna choose a resistor that can handle enough power for the amount of power that's gonna be dropped across it, right? So if we have one amp flowing through it and it's 0.1 ohms, that means we're gonna have about 100 milliwatts flowing through this resistor. So you wanna make sure you get a high enough wattage resistor and of course you want to go a little higher than the max wattage, right? So you know that it's going to last a long time and not burn up. For L1, I'm using a 100 microfarad inductor. Now, how did I get 100 microfarads? Well, you could go to the data sheet and they have an equation where you can calculate the exact inductance. But you don't even need to do that because if you look at the data sheet, they say, well, if you're going to use it at one amp and this much voltage, here's a range of inductance values you should choose and they recommended 100 microhenry, so, so that's what I went with. Now I have a 1.7 amp inductor that I, that I chose to reduce heating. Like I've said in the past, whenever you design circuits, you typically have to do more than one iteration. So when I did my first iteration of this simple circuit, I chose an inductor that was about 1.2 amps instead of 1.7. And what I found was the inductor heated up, and I wasn't comfortable with how much heat 
it was generating. So I went with a higher amperage inductor. Now the trade-off of course is higher amperage usually means a little more expensive and it's gonna be bigger. But this circuit's pretty small and I don't have space constraints. So I was more comfortable going with a 1.7 amp inductor that I wouldn't have to use active cooling with, with this circuit. Here's D1, I chose a Schottky diode, once again because a Schottky diode has a lower voltage drop so you get better efficiency. I chose two amps, once again because I don't want my circuit to generate a lot of heat. So this gives me plenty of amp margin for this diode. C1, I chose 10 microfarads. Why did I choose 10 microfarads? Because that's what the data sheet recommended. I'm using a ceramic capacitor. So that's what MLCC stands for, multi-layer ceramic capacitor. I'm using XR7 dielectric, which is what the data sheet recommended. And basically, when you're talking about ceramic capacitors, you have different choices of dielectric material, which has different pros and cons. XR7 has a low ESR, a low equivalent series resistance. And the reason they want that is so this capacitor can charge and discharge quickly to keep that voltage level steady. And also the data sheet mentions that you want to keep this capacitor close to the input of the voltage for this IC. In the schematic, I'm showing it off to the side, but when I do the PCB layout, it'll be close to the input. C2 is, was once again recommended by the data sheet, 10 nanofarads. My guess is they're using it to shunt high frequency noise to ground. And I added R2, which is just a current limiting resistor. So PWM control is going to come in from my microcontroller so I can control the brightness of the LEDs by controlling the current. Another thing you could add to this circuit, which I don't have, is a Zener diode to make sure VCC doesn't get too high in voltage. I plan to use a bulk 60 volt power supply in my design, which will have protection on it already, so I didn't add a Zener diode here, but you could. Okay, that's it for part one. For this video series on my Patreon page, that's where I'm gonna post the design files, that's where I'll post the bomb, and I'll also post the example Arduino code I used to do the demo. And I'm also gonna have some extra video content from part two on my Patreon page. Also on my Patreon page, I'm gonna put part two up right away. So once you see part one on YouTube, part two will be available on my Patreon page. If you don't join my Patreon page, that's okay too. You'll just see part two, two or three days later. If you have any questions on this video, use the com comment section below. And if you, you think I missed anything or have anything to add, use the comment section below. See you back here for part two and thank you for watching.